Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt where we read better, not more. Today we're going to talk about sense and sensibility. Now it seems like Jane Austen was working on Eleanor and Marianne and First Impressions and Lady Susan or maybe Catherine all around the same time, maybe even the Watsons as well. The Watsons seems to be maybe written during Bath, so maybe a little bit later. But Eleanor and Marianne would be revised into Sense and Sensibility, First Impressions would be revised into Pride and Prejudice, and Lady Susan would never be published during her life. It appears that the early drafts were written as epistolary novels as well, that Jane Austen enjoyed and was influenced by Samuel Richardson and other authors of the time who were using the form is pretty apparent. Now, I want to talk a little bit about epistolary novels, and I know that I'm repeating myself because this is something <laughs> Apparently I feel strongly about, but not everybody's seen all my videos. So epistolary novels are a pretty confining and constraining form. If you take a look at my recent video where I was comparing first person versus third person close, I talk about how the first person narrative is more limiting than third person close because the author with that narrative voice is able to introduce thoughts and ideas and observations that the character isn't consciously aware of. And in the same way, epistolary is even more limiting than first person because we don't put everything that we think and feel into letters. We don't put, you know, all of our activities that we went through the day in into our letters. And so there's a layer of artificiality about, it. I mean, obviously all of the novels are artificial. They're sort of all attempting a realism to a greater or lesser degree, but there's an additional layer of artificiality about letters to sort of like have letters be the thing that carry the plot forward. And I would again refer here to another another video in which I talked about this, uh, my discussion of Dracula, where we have characters in, you know, the midst of disasters choosing to write in their diaries or compose elegant letters home and that sort of thing. Uh, and this is a pitfall for Richardson too. It sort of like forces his hand to have his characters constantly writing about the most essential things that are happening to them. But sometimes these things are so disastrous that it just doesn't make sense that a writer would be pulling out their let you know their diary or pulling out a letter home to be like let me take a moment of leisure where is my wax seal oh right i've been imprisoned and kidnapped and i left that on my desk at home anyway there's just like sort of a letter level of like surreality there but sense and uh, with pride and prejudice get revised into a third person narrative and we can still see the traces of its form letters in both books continue to be a central feature of the plot, often moving the plot forward in key areas. Much less so do we see that in Mansfield, like yes, we know that she writes to her sister at home, she writes to her brother who is in the Navy and that sort of thing, but letters have a decreasing role in some of her later novels by comparison. But as for sense, the narration continues to focus on Eleanor. And honestly, who doesn't love Eleanor? I mean, I certainly do. Her patience, her sound judgment, her tender love for her sister and her mother. I think in sense, we have a family with its foibles, but a nuclear unit that's easier to love than say the Bennets or the Elliots. We have a mom who really cares for both of her daughters. And even though the narration is quite clear that she has a preference for Marianne because they're more similar, there's certainly no lack of love for Eleanor. It's just that she has a different personality from Marianne and Mrs. Dashwood. There's also quite a few darker themes in Sense and Sensibility as well. The real economic instability of the family and what they face, as opposed to the probable danger of the Bennets who still have their father safely in command of their family home. We actually have the loss of the father and the husband in the first few chapters. Colonel Brandon's backstory with its, his wicked father and his lost love and his young ward and her tragedy and all of that. I mean, like that sounds like something out of a Richardson novel, but it's put more to, you know, off stage, right? So we don't actually experience any of these actions, but a lot of these happen off stage. And all of this culminates in the climax of the book, which is Marianne's illness and near death experience. And that is really one of the most gothic scenes in all of Jane Austen's literature. Northanger included. Northanger obviously has a bit more of a sort of satirical approach to some of the gothic elements in fiction, but this is almost like a true gothic scene. 
unlike with Pride and Prejudice, in which the title sort of teasingly asks us whether Darcy or Lizzie is Pride or Prejudice, and we can see their flaws and foibles in both of those attributes. And, and in fact, sometimes those, those attributes get turned on their head and we see them as virtues rather than vices, i.e., you know, Darcy does, has no undue pride, right? He, his pride is commensurate with his position and with his quality as a man. And we might call that self-esteem nowadays. Or even with Lizzie, that she's perspicacious rather than judgmental, that she has insight into people's characters, which is often true for her. With Sense and Sensibility, it is about two heroines, or I mean, or the two sisters, not like two love interests, our heroine and our hero. And there's no doubt which is which, right? We don't necessarily see each learning to be better, we see the one who's superior and the other growing to be more like her. And perhaps what I find most clever about this book is that Eleanor is the main character. We see most things from her perspective and we understand the world through her judgment. It is her romance that creates the main narrative arc, and yet Marianne is the tra traditional romantic heroine. She's much more of an Elizabeth Bennet character, and in fact, like Elizabeth, is a second daughter. Um, she's passionate, she's artistic, she's untamed, she's bold, she's more beautiful, um, and no doubt from Marianne's perspective, she is the heroine of her own story. But she's unable and unwilling to see the way in which Eleanor is sort of still waters run deep, if you will, and so she casts herself as the lead in her own family circle. Her romance with Willoughby is much seen, much talked about, and central to her own world, yet she is second unknowingly. She is second to fall in love, she is second to be heartbroken, she is second to be married, she is the second daughter of a second marriage who must concede the value of a second love. I'm going to be honest, I'm really proud of myself for that part of my script. But let's sort of talk about judging Marianne's character. I find that I actually have a much more sympathetic view toward Marianne than many readers. And in fact, I was buddy reading this book with a friend of mine and we were reading two different editions and so she was sharing some snippets from the introduction to hers and I was sharing some snippets from the introduction to mine. I was reading the Penguin Classics, by the way. It, it had a really nice introduction, I really enjoyed it. The, the, per, the critic who wrote the introduction to my friend's version had a much more negative view of Marianne than I personally do. Yes, she is absolutely sort of wrapped up in her own world and her own emotions, but let's not forget that she's like, what, 15 or 16 throughout the majority of this novel, so I don't find it unrealistic for her age that she might be immature in that way. I know I was wrapped up in my own world at that age. But there's no doubt that she tenderly loves her sister and they have a really, really sweet relationship. Her defensiveness rises when people don't properly appreciate Eleanor's drawings. And it's not just about her, how particular she is about the way in which people ought to respond to art. It really is about her affection for her sister as well. And, and this makes me soften toward her. Yes, she's immature, and I think in combination with Willoughby, she can be unkind and dismissive of others, especially when they don't think, act, or feel in the same way that she does. She ha has sort of a little allowance for differences in temperament, but she grows and she develops as a character. Eleanor's character, on the other hand, does not seem to grow much. When we first meet her, she was already kind, mature, of sound judgment and taste, gentle and wise, even guiding her mother's decisions and judgment. And instead, we see throughout the course of this novel that it's not so much that she grows as a character, but that of the other characters around her grow in understanding her appropriately and properly, specifically her sister and her mother. And it's more that her character is revealed to the other people in the novel around her. One thematic element that I thought was kind of fun, I want to talk about briefly, is that wordplay. It's really a um, Wordplay often comes up more in discussion with Emma, and I think it is more prominent in Emma than it is here. But we have this sort of teasing game around the name of Mr. F. We have the giant W on Marianne's letters once they are, you know, in London and she's writing to Willoughby. This speaks to the sort of larger structure of interplay. Marianne at one point mistakes Edward for Willoughby when it's that Edward comes to visit the Dashwoods in their new cottage. Likewise, Eleanor mistakes Willoughby for Colonel Brandon when Marianne is sick. And the two sisters are often judged in contrast to one another. And they're, the interlocking relationships and the interlocking narrative of the two girls' romances are essential to sort of to the structure of the plot. And as always in Austen's novels, another major theme is the mutual impact that couples have on one another. That Mr. John Dashwood, their half-brother, 
would not be such a ninny if he had not married such a shrew of a wife is sort of consistently placed before the reader. That Willoughby brings out the worst and most self-centered qualities in Marianne is constantly before the reader. And I think, you know, that's one of the reasons why I don't particularly like them as a couple, even though they're really fun to watch them fall in love and flirt with each other and be sort of like this young and passionate couple. What we really see is at the end of the day that both of them are self-indulgent in their approach to the relationship, that they're getting from the other person some sort of like self-satisfaction. It's not really a generous love. Um, and then the other thing is that we see both of them kind of be, well, uh, we definitely see Willoughby making Marianne a worse person that sh than she is without him. She sort of exaggerates the darker side of her qualities. And so that's one of the reasons why if people were to ask me, well, what do you think if they were to have actually gotten together? I think, no, it's much better that she married Colonel Bradley. <laughs> anyway, that Mrs. Palmer irritates Mr. Palmer and that sort of causes him to exaggerate his ill temper is also constantly before the reader. And which couples to root for? That Eleanor and Edward are well matched in education, ambition, temperament, and understanding. That Colonel Brandon's quiet passion at once tempers and inspires Ma Marianne's passionate response. These two are constantly before the reader. And finally, Willoughby. How do we judge him? And, you know, it's really hard for me. When I was reading this book, I was kind of thinking to myself, well, what makes Willoughby so different from Wickham to me? You know, I, I really think that, you know, I walk away from Pride and Prejudice thinking worse of Wickham than I do of Willoughby. Both take advantage of young girls to satisfy their own daughters. I think Wickham is probably more conscientious in his pursuit. I would kind of, you know, I'd be more likely to describe him as a predator of young girls. As young as 14 and mercenary in his plots to add to it, Willoughby, as he explains it for himself, really is just trying to satisfy his own enjoyment. He's a, he's flirtation, you know, it's, it's fun to flirt with young girls, it's fun to inspire their admiration, and he clearly enjoys himself with uh, Colonel Brandon's ward, but he never really fell truly in love until he meets Marianne. But he's also such a weak character, right? And so he's neither strong enough to deny his materialistic indulgences, to stand by his true love, nor is he strong enough to stand by his ultimate decision and his ultimate decision for marriage with Miss Gray. Willoughby would always be regretting his decision, no matter who he married. He would never be satisfied because he never learned self-restraint and he never learned self-control. He always just gave in to what he wanted. And, but at least Wickham doesn't deceive himself that, you know, the pure pursuit of his own desires is anything virtuous. And then I think there's another interesting aspect to this novel in which the sense of propriety and, and conversations about what is a proper way to behave it shows up in this novel a lot more than any of the other ones, including Pride and Prejudice, because that's the main tension between the two sisters, proper behavior. We have Marianne really pushing up against those sort of ideals constantly. And um, they both have deep convictions about what is proper. So like Lydia is not necessarily like trying to make some argument of like, oh, these standards for propriety are, are incorrect. Here are standards for propriety that I think are correct. Like Marianne has very cl clear views on what she thinks is the right way to love, think and feel. Lydia is just kind of like, I just want to do what I want, right? Marianne is absolutely following her convictions about proper behavior. They just disagree about what proper behavior should be. Um, and I think Marianne has this very strong ethic of like honest self-expression. And so for Marianne, privacy is almost akin to deception. But Eleanor has a very different view. Self-expression is not the highest good for her, especially if it violates other ethics. If self-expression hurts other people, then it's not okay. Untempered self-expression can even hurt the future self, which we see with, through Marianne, Marianne herself experiences. So the tension here is ultimately about a society in transition between sort of like a collectivist viewpoint versus an individualistic viewpoint, between an honor-shame society versus a pride-guilt society. Eleanor's desire for Marianne to sort of like pick her head up from her own sort of egotistic focus and take a look around her at other people is part of her desire 
for Marianne to take responsibility for the way in which she participates in society, to get the benefits of social structure, peace, pleasure, dancing, parties, music, is also to, also to agree to abide by its rules, which Marianne, Marianne does not always feel obligated to do. So you gain honor by properly participating in society and shame from impropriety, from improperly participating in society. Marianne, on the other hand, views herself in a much more individualistic light. She glories in personal pride, that she has individualistic opinions about art and poetry, that she individualistically feels passionately and intensely, that she individualistically determines propriety for her behavior with reference to her own convictions, not really taking into account other people's opinions. Nothing could be more natural for the implied engagement for hers and Willoughby's hearts to visit Combe Magna unchamperoned. It, you know, it's like completely natural for her and her worldview. So for Marianne, the essence far, far outstrips the form or the formality of the thing. That she and Willoughby have a deep and passionate love is more important than that he actually take the formal steps and perform sort of like the steps of the dance, if you will, speaks the socially required lines of engagement. And that is where the betrayal comes, actually. It's when Willoughby sort of wriggles out of their understood engagement by returning to the old rules and the old system, the old forms, as an excuse. And Eleanor doesn't abandon the essence for the forms. She and Edward have a deep and abiding and true love as well. Clearly, adhering strictly to the forms without the essence leads to pain, hypocrisy, most embodied by the approach represented by Mrs. Ferrers, by Willoughby's powerful and wealthy aunt, by other people who are sort of wealthy hypocrites who are playing by the rules of society, but have no, you know, natural taste, even with the way that they approach art, which is what Marianne criticizes them for. But it's about a blend between the two is really what it seems that Austen is advocating here. And what we have then is a society that is transitioning into a more individualistic approach. It's the gray area in between. And I think that's part of why Austen's ethics feel so slippery when you read her books. Is she progressive or is she a traditionalist? That she is in favor of love matches rather than political or mercenary ones is on the side of progressivism and individualism. That the way in which a person pursues this ideal is also important to her. But that's in favor more of traditionalism and a, a value for the community, a value for the whole. That love and affection can sink under the weight of impecuniary circumstances is a reality that she's sort of constantly placing before the reader who would veer too idealistically, right? That we have a romance novel at all with marriage plots that are, are about love matches is evidence of this rising individualistic culture as opposed to say like Beowulf with his varying and decaying honorable and dishonorable supporter men, with his victories for honor, with his defense of the social body represented you know, by the Great Hall. Austen and English literature at large are moving away from collectivism, moving away from honor shame, moving toward individualism with personal pride and guilt. Perhaps what is most quintessentially Austen is the way in which she gives the reader an insight that exposes rich hypocrites. This happens mostly through the secret engagement between Edward Ferrers and Lucy Steele. It exposes Mr. and Mrs. John Dashwood to be prejudiced against Eleanor, to invite the Steeles to their uh, London home rather than their own family. It leads Mrs. Ferrers to unduly compliment a person of lesser quality, to unduly insult a person of greater merit. These characters judge by money, not by quality. They are led by the outcomes that they want, not by the reality that is before them. Just as Eleanor and Marianne are held in comparison to one another, so too are we meant to judge Edward and Willoughby against one another. Both are young men who do not fulfill their potential primarily because they don't have the proper employment in which to direct their talents. Educated, wealthy, idle, Edward spends too much time with the Steele family and gets himself too early and trapped in an engagement with the uh, clever and manipulating Lucy Steele. Willoughby, too used to indulging himself, is unable to make sacrifices when necessary. Edward faces the pressure to break off his first engagement when it's all that he would love to be able to do, but does what is honorable in maintaining his promise to Lucy. Willoughby faces also pressure to give up his first love, Marianne, and instead make a new engagement for mercenary reasons when it goes against all that he wants to do, and yet he gives into it. In both of these characters, we see the evils and pitfalls of an idle lifestyle. Whew, 
we have covered a lot of ground with this one, <laughs> lots of topics, but that's all I have for you today. I hope you're enjoying Jane Austen July. I certainly am. If you're reading Sense and Sensibility, I would love to hear about your observations on the text. Leave me some comments. Until next time, I'm Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile.